Greetings everyone. Today we continue our reading and discussion of Prabhuji's book Bhakti Yoga the Path of Love. We are in introduction and we will continue from the following sentence. Prabhuji writes Bhakti is the purest and most elevated love. It arises from the depths of consciousness and the peace and silence of meditation. When we experience this love, we discover that it is not an emotion or a feeling, but what is real within us. Because transcendental reality can only manifest itself in pure hearts, Bhakti Yoga offers a process of spiritual cleansing and purification. Although it is said that the path of Bhakti is accessible to everyone, I would say that it is a journey exclusively for those who hear the call of love from the depths of their soul. The message of Bhakti Yoga is unequivocal. Love is the means and the goal. Without devotion, spiritual practice seems dry, prayers turns into unnecessary chatter, and religion becomes boring. It is reduced to a mere collection of laws, commandments, and ceremonies and becomes more political than spiritual. Indeed, only by surrendering yourself to your own heart can you know what religion truly is. Prabhuji writes here, Bhakti is the purest and most elevated love. And in my humble understanding, this is a very significant uh, portion because we could understand the beginning of introduction that Prabhuji tries to show us something that we believe love is, but something that love is not. And in the following chapter, we will learn about the way that Prabhuji see the evolution of love. So Prabhuji writes here that Bhakti is the purest and most elevated love. So what we all know as love, is love. And I will not go into it right now because Prabhuji will write it in such an eloquent way in a future chapter. But this is a very important point because often when we come to the path of religion, when we come to the spiritual life, we, we come aspiring to attain a certain goal and Prabhuji will conclude this portion, speaking that Bhakti bring this unequivocal message about the past itself. But we come with this concept that what we possess, what we know, our reality, the world that we know, is not what we want is something that we see as an obstacle, as a bondage, as a place of suffering that we need to escape, or that we promise that if we follow the rules and regulations, although we will not be able to escape this fleeting, painful, limited reality, in this lifetime, but we promise a paradise if we act by certain laws, a freedom, an ideally, ideal world in an afterlife. But Prabhuji shows here that no, bhakti is love, but it's a purest, most elevated love. And the next sentence is very significant for me because 
He explained why. It arises from the depths of consciousness and the peace and silence of meditation. So, in my humble understanding, it gives us certain direction. So, the reality that we know, our life experience, is not bad. It is not a place that we need to liberate ourselves from. It's just lacking a depth. So, the purest love, the love that Prabhuji calls in the beginning of introduction is a mystery of human heart, is here. It's in us, with us, and is, as Prabhuji will write below, it's not an emotion, we experience it as emotion because of our level of consciousness because we're not able to dive deep because we are too distracted. And this is a very important point because it's not a matter of following certain rules or doing certain things or searching for some distant star and, and, and finding some paradise that lies way uh, beyond our comprehension. The direction is exactly opposite. The direction is to come closer. The direction is to, to leave our distractions, to relax, to create a silence. And when Prabhupada speaks about the purity of the heart, the yoga vidya of the path of bhakti, the the way to create conditions that that pure and most elevated love could shine in our hearts. This is what he writes here, that the direction is closer. The direction is not to try to obtain some unreachable goal, but to create the conditions to meditate. And as I understand the way that Prabhupada see meditation is to be able to be present at this moment and to be able to observe reality as it is or as he writes and entitled one of his books that we'll discuss in the future, to be able to see what is as it is. So our problem right now is not that we do not love, but the way we able to perceive, to experience love is very limited. And Prabhuji continues writing, when we experience this love, we discover that it is not an emotion of feeling. This is our common experience if we're lucky, as he wrote earlier, to stumble upon this incredible feeling when we love somebody or something. But Prabhupada just say, no, it's not, we will discover that it's not an emotion or a feeling. But what is real within us. And I feel that, I don't know even if I can express or share the depths of this. So love is what is real within us. We often hear that God is love. And Prabhuji writes in his preface that the journey of his life is an odyssey from what he believed 
himself to be to what he truly is. And this is the direction that he offer us to follow, to discover the reality of who we are, of what we are. And when we able to find, when we able to touch what is real within us, as Prabhupada writes here, we will realize that that incredible feeling, that incredible taste that life offers us in a very limited way. It's our own reality. It's not depend on anyone or anything, but rather it is a manifestation of, of who we are or what we are. It's our intrinsic quality. And then Prabhuji begins to speak about the sadhana bhakti, the yoga vidya of this path. He writes, because transcendental reality can only manifest itself in pure hearts, bhakti yoga offers a process of spiritual cleansing and purification. And I feel that this is such an important point. Because, as I said before, when we come to spiritual life, very often in the frame of religion, we live with this um, feeling that we are as we are, we are no good. We are sinners, we are lost. If we suffer in this world and we ask for the divine, we ask for the spiritual master, we ask for from God to liberate us from our suffering. We promised some reward that lies far away, outside of our reach. And all our efforts directed there. And Prabhupada just say no. The direction is to reflect something. As we spoke before, according to what Prabhupada just say, the, the reality is present here. The, the God, love, everything is here, every single moment. But because it lacks objective qualities and all we know is to perceive the objective things or objects, we're not able to perceive it. So it's one of the great saints and Prabhupada will write about that exalted being in this book, Sri Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, an incarnation, according to Gaudiya Vaishnavism, an incarnation of Lord Sri Krishna, and an incarnation that came to this world to experience this pure love, this pure bhakti. In the only text that he wrote, he begins from that called Shikshastaka, few verses, that's all we have in the sense of writing from, from him. He writes, he begins by saying, Cheto Darpana Marjanam, to clean the mirror of the heart. And this is what Prabhupada writes here, and this is the path of the Sadhana Bhakti, the way I understand Prabhuji, the entire spiritual life, the, all our practices, all our ceremonies, everything we do within the frame of religion um, or on a spiritual, or throughout our spiritual search, is only one thing. We cannot 
obtain God. We cannot reach ourselves because we are here. We cannot bring ourselves from some faraway place. And if Prabhupada writes here that love, divinity, is what is real within us. Reality is, by very definition, is what is real within us. So, our problem is, is lack of attention. Our problem is that we're not able to perceive it. And often when I hear, I don't know, I assume that some of you can identify with this feeling, which being misused for centuries, this feeling that we are inadequate, that we are sinners, that we are fallen, that we are, and we need to do something to remediate this situation. And when we hear that our hearts are impure, it creates a horrible feeling, like, oh my God, my heart is so dirty, we dirty, we are polluted. And in my humble understanding, it's, there is a big mistake here. Yes, our heart, we need to purify our heart. But that purity is nothing to do with who we are. It, it's to, to silence the waves of the lake in order to be able to see what is what lies underneath right now it shouldn't arise in us and it does a self condemnation we're not horrible beings we just live with the treasure that we are completely unaware of it and this is what Prabhuji concludes this portion writing that bhakti brings unequivocal message that love is the means and the goal. And when we speak about purifying our heart, is the process, it begins, continues and ends in love. And probably you will quote a great luminary a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, Sri Swami Vivekananda, from his book Bhakti Yoga. But so this process of purification is process that should be performed, if you can say, with love from the very, very beginning. And for me personally, it's very important because we can waste years of our life and a lot of energy by trying to eliminate the darkness, to trying to fight some imaginary demons and rather than create a condition, meditate, become more aware, to understand that the thing that we're looking for, they're not bad, they just will not satisfy us and when we are able to stop our endless run and to look at life with clarity as much as we can we will be able to see that it's not bad it's just it's not enough and and this is for me a very different direction very different understanding that we strive for something better we're not trying to diminish ourselves. We need, and in order to strive for something better, we need every bit of energy that we have within us. We need courage. We need so much love. So this is so important, this process of purification that starts and ends in love. Prabhuji continues here, writing, Although it is said 
that the path of bhakti is accessible to everyone, I would say that is a journey exclusively for those who hear the call of love from the depths of their soul. And I feel it's a beautiful point because there is a, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with that, there is a very old discussion between the, I would call this a rational approach to religion and the emotional one. And there are certain schools of thought that reject emotion or see emotion as something inferior. And in different parts of religion, there are many so beautiful examples of this simplicity, this simple approach. There is a beautiful story that comes to mind just to, to show this. And it exists. I will, I will bring two different anecdotes that Prabhuji shared. One from Vaishnava tradition, which Bhakti very much represent. There is a story that that great luminary an incredible enlightened being, the avatar, the manifest the incarnation of Lord Sri Krishna, according to Gaudiya Vaishnavism, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he used to travel a lot. He walked all across the Bengal and visited many places and he visited one of the temples and he saw a very poor Brahmana sit in a corner and read Bhagavad Gita. And he saw that the fellow men around him mock him and make different jokes and humiliate him in all sort of ways. So. Lord Chaitanya, out of his loving, merciful and blissful nature, he approached the, the man and asked him, Sir, what are you engaged in? What are you reading? And the Brahmana replied, Kind Sir, I am reading Bhagavad Gita. And Lord Chaitanya asked him, So what? What do you feel? What, what is your impression? And he said, kind sir, I'm sorry to say, but I come from the very poor family and I didn't receive a proper education, so I'm illiterate. Then Lord Chaitanya asked him, so how are you able to read? He said, sir, I, I don't know, but I just go through the pages and when I see a picture of Lord Sri Krishna riding in a chariot and acting as a charioteer of his devotee Arjuna, it fills me with so much devotion how God himself served his devotee in such an incredible way. And the tears come into my eyes and I feel blissful. And Lord Chaitanya turned to those brahmanas that mocked this, this man and told him, this is, this is the one, this is the one that can understand Bhagavad Gita, this is the one, this is the way to read Bhagavad Gita. And from the different tradition, there is another story about a different luminary from the Hebrew tradition a great Hasidic master, Baal Shem Tov. There are many different stories about him. He was quite an incredible being, probably shared a lot of anecdotes. But one that shows kind of a similar approach that he visited oh, in the synagogue during the prayer time. And he paid attention to a man that stood way 
behind everybody in a very kind of humble way. And it grabbed him his attention and he came to him and said, Sir, he... and again, the, the public, which is often happens, mocking him and laughing at him and do all kind of nasty things toward him. So Baal Shem Tov approached him and asked him, Sir, what are you doing? And the person say, Sir, I'm so sorry, but to say I'm illiterate. I can't read. The only thing I know, I'm so ha grateful that I know the... So I cannot pray from the Siddur, I cannot pray from the prayer book. So Baal Shem Tov asked him, so what do you do? He say, the man asked, answer, um, I know the letters, a few of them. So all I can do, I say Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and, and continue. I, I offer the letters to the Lord. And the, the all merciful, the all, this great God, he will take those letters, I hope, and he will compose the most beautiful prayers that he would like. And Baal Shem Tov, again, in a similar way, said, this is, this is the true way to pray. This is, the, this is the devotion. This is the true faith. This is, this is an incredible example of that. In this discussion between the rational and emotional, there is this approach that's saying that bhakti is for everyone because we're all able to feel emotion, we all have in some level ever loved something or someone, so there is this often, sometimes in a mocking way to say, no, bhakti is for, for everyone, or in, in a different way, bhakti in a way came as, as a revolution against the organized Brahminical religion about where the only a chosen few claim the right to worship the divine, to, to practice religion and to attain their uh, paradise and immortality. And Bhakti came as a revolutionary movement that said that it's open for everyone that if divine love is, as Prabhupada just say here, is what is real within us, it's, it's within every single one of us and we all have a right to experience love, to, to experience what we are, to be what we are. This is our birthright. No one can take it from us regardless of our, if we speak in, in the language of Sanatana Dharma, of our caste, of our position, in society, of our wealth, of our political situation. It doesn't really matter. This is more real than what we think we are. That's more real than everything we know. This, the reality itself. So we all, this is, as I understand, this is the message of, this is a revolutionary message that Lord Chaitanya brought and in general that Bhakti brought, that it's, it's open uh, for everyone. But Prabhuji writes here, it's, it's, in his opinion, it's more for people that feel this calling. And this is a beauty because we have a different path inside Sanatana Dharma, infinite path, in a way this a very wrong definition that we're all familiar with when we refer to eternal Dharma, Vaidika Dharma, Sanatana Dharma. As Hinduism, it's a very... It's a Western way to define things. It's very wrong and gives a very limited uh, understanding of what we are looking at and what is in front of us. Because it's it's like it will be similar to say here in the United States, uh, this is religion of America. What is religion of America? There are so many religions 
here. It's a place that you can find everything. It's uh, the entire globe is here, represented in so many different ways. This is part of the beauty of this country. But so Hinduism comprise what we call Hinduism comprise of infinite paths, infinite religions, infinite philosophy, often contradictory. In some way, we can see them as contradictory. But uh, so we all have different inclinations. There are different aspects in us that are more dominant, that manifest it more. And although love is is what is real, as Prabhuji writes here, it's it's a reality within every single one of us, but it can be more accessible to certain people. And as I understand, this is what Prabhuji writes here, that it's more for this particular path, is more for people that feel this calling. And this is very important because it's not it's a calling. It's not something that we read in a book and say, oh, that sounds great. Oh, that's promised me I will be so blissful. I will be so happy. So let me take it. It's not this kind of rational approach. Or this is or this is the easiest path. Sometimes people say bhakti is the easiest path to reach divinity. So let me take an easy way. Let me take a shortcut. It doesn't work this way. Prabhuji speaks about calling, which also, in my understanding, refers to something that the path of religion, the spiritual path, this desire to, to seek reality, in some way has nothing to do with what we perceive ourselves to be. It's come from the depths of our existence. It's a calling, but not calling from far away. It's calling from the depths of our heart in general, not only on the path of bhakti. That's how I understand this. So this is a very significant point because often when we try to rationalize our life, we need to keep it in mind and rationalize, oh yes, I chose this path and that path. Yes, we can try to, to, to follow the path of the mind and to come with some rational conclusions, but we, we will be disappointed because the real thing has nothing to do with what we know has nothing to do with what we think we are. It's a calling. It's a certain moment in our process of evolution. And we often hear that uh, we see a man as the crown of evolutionary process, but then, as Prabhuji explained, begins, the man is not the end. And Prabhuji quotes, Friedrich Nietzsche is experimenting with the truth. The man is a bridge. We are in a process. We spoke about it. So it's a process. And then begins the process of involution. And the beginning of this process of involution, one of the signs of this process of involution, that we've, we begin to feel this calling something that very mysterious and something that is overpowering if we really feel calling if we really feel this vocation even if we try to ignore it we can do it for some time but in some point we will start our search because if this is what we are if this is life, reality itself calling us, it's so much greater than this limited personality that what we know we are right now, what we experience ourselves to be. So when this calling comes, we can't really resist. And we maybe do many mistakes and maybe we will misplace it 
for some time, but eventually it will push us to toward finding of what we are, who we are, toward the search after the reality of life, after divinity. So Prabhupada continues here, and we spoke about it a bit before. The message of bhakti yoga is unequivocal. Love is the means and the goal. And he brings some example to kind of show this in a way, the importance of bhakti on the spiritual path. Without devotion, spiritual practice seems dry. Prayer turns into unnecessary chatter and the religion becomes boring. It is reduced to a merry collection of laws, commandments, and ceremonies, and becomes more political than spiritual. And he concludes writing, Indeed, only by surrendering yourself to your own heart can you know what religion truly is. And here we come to what is religion. Now, when we speak about yoga, what is yoga? We often hear that yoga is union, similar to religare, the Latin religare, which means reconnect. So when we speak about the path of religion, we speak about the union, often in our understanding, union with the divine. But, and when we speak about love, we speak about union. And Prabhupada will write it in, in the future that the, the essence of that is this calling that comes from what is real within us that wants to come back to the source, wants to unite. The path of religion, the love wants to, even in this manifestation, when it's manifested, as probably you will explain, as attachment, when we feel desire to unite with something or someone, the direction is to unite, not to fracture. And we need to remember that, and as Prabhupada writes here, if there is no love on the path of religion, if there is no calling to become one, to unite, if the path of religion is the path based on the promise of escaping hell and reaching heaven, or escaping this painful reality, this fleeting reality of this world, and reaching this promise of immortality, if it's something very rational, if it's a if it's a solution, if it's a path to offer a solution and offer a very certain and a quick one, that if we join this or that a religious establishment or organization or whatever we, we will uh, be happy, we will be I don't know, often <laughs> <laughs> on a very superficial level, we will receive some even, I don't know, financial benefits. Will, God will give us a frigidaire and a car and a good life and a beautiful wife. And, and, and this is, it's fine. That's part of our a process of evolution and religion. But probably you say if there is no real calling, if there is no bhakti, if there is no love, then what's the point of all of that? What's the so then he say when you pray to the divine, you can pray to the divine out of habit or, or because you're born in this and that tradition and that's all you know, and you forced to go to church because that's what your parents do, and 
or you being told that if you don't follow this or that regulation, you will suffer for eternity and you scare it to death. So you have to do it. Probably just say that then religion become boring or this is the reason that so many people nowadays uh, shun religion and reject it and, and see it as something very negative in a way. So without love, as Prabhupada writes here, the, the prayer become a chatter because if, and, and we can bring it, we started from the point that love is the purest expression of love. So some something of love we know. So imagine yourself that you're in front of your beloved. Also, we all had this experience of person that we, we once really loved. This might give us some sense. And with the time, our emotions change, our bodies changing, the beauty fading, so many things happens. So we often know people say, love you, love you, love you, love you, or, and it's become empty. It's become habit, like to say, how are you doing? Without expecting any answer, like, how do you do? Or, hi. And you continue your life. So in our relation to the divine, we can see it in a very similar way. There is another very beautiful example that comes to mind that uh, Prabhuji shared from Hebrew tradition. We spoke about that great luminary, incredible master, Baal Shem Tov. So to, to, to show this, it's a very good example for that. There is a story about him uh, being invited to a very beautiful, very rich, very famous and a very high esteemed a, a, a temple, a Jewish temple, synagogue. And he, he was very known at that time and people expect him with a lot of honor and a lot of excitement. And when he arrived to the place, he stepped at the door and stayed there. And everybody was very confused and ask him, Reverend Sir, why don't you step in? And he said, I'm sorry, I can't. They said, you can't? Why you can't? He said, I, I can't. This place is full. This place is full of letters. It's full of letters. Because the, the prayers don't go anywhere. So they're all stuck in this place, so I cannot enter, I, 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 I just can't. And this is a very extreme example that show us what religion can be without devotion. And Lord Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita advises us that you can offer me, he doesn't ask us for a gold or riches or anything, he doesn't need anything. He asks, you can offer me patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhaktiya prayacheti. You can offer me a leaf or flower or a little water, but the most important was devotion. And in the process, and we will read about the archana, in the process of worship of the divine. So beautiful because there are different upacharas, there are different items of worship, or different ways that we can worship the Lord from three and five to 64 and very elaborated puja with worship with a lot of uh, recitation of uh, ancient Vedic mantras and prayers and, and ceremonies that last for hours and hours and hours and hours. But there is something very beautiful that the most important upachara, the most important item, and maybe the only one that really matter, and, and if you don't have anything, if you don't have any means, if you can't offer to the Lord anything, 
the most important one is bhakti. And, and this is a very significant here. And Prabhupada writes here, when this happens, that religion becomes more political than spiritual. And we know that for thousands of years, this sentiment, this promise, or this inert search that we all have for, for a reality, for something greater than ourselves, it was misused so many times. So many crimes, so many wars, so many bloodshed. Until today, we're committed to the name of the divine. And when we look at it, it's, it's very sad and it's such an absurd, but this is when religion uh, become political. And Prabhuji concludes this. Indeed, only by surrendering yourself to your own heart can you know what religion truly is. And I feel it is so profound because this aspect of surrender, and again, it, this aspect of surrender has been misused and we often afraid to surrender and to give up what we feel we have. And I feel this is such a beautiful direction that Prabhupada shows us that when we speak about when Lord Sri Krishna tell us in Bhagavad Gita Sarvadarman Paritya Jai Mamikam Sharanam Raja Amtam Sarva Papibyo Mokshisha Mima Suchaha when he speaks of, when we speak about surrender, abandoning everything we know, abandoning everything that we feel we possess, and surrendering to me, Lord Sri Krishna say, we actually surrendering to our own heart. And uh, I wish myself to understand this really deeper because this can give us a peace and a courage to, to do this step, to, to be able to rest in to fall, it's like to fall back from the cliff into the arms of life, into the arms of reality, into the arms of love. Jai Prabhuji.